Thanks for joining us on another episode of the In the Game interview series. Today we've got Paul Hogan with us, head women's coach at Coastal Carolina. Uh, Paul, thanks for, for joining us. Um, why don't you take a few minutes, kind of give us your background, you know, where did you, where did you grow up playing, uh, playing in college, um, what got you into coaching, and, and how long you've been in your current role? Yeah, my name is Paul Hogan. I uh, grew up in New York, um, just outside the city, and I played, you know, club soccer growing up, played basketball, baseball, and when I hit about 13, I really started full-time soccer all, you know, all the year, all year, and um, from that point on, it was chasing dream, trying, you know, trying to make ODP. And in New York, you have what we call the Empire State Games, which are pretty massive, make those teams. Um, high school soccer was really, really big by us. Really good level, actually. Football, high school football was pretty, pretty awful. Um, so soccer was a big deal for us in, in high school. Um, and then going to college, uh, I played at the University of Charleston in West Virginia for three of my four years. Um, there, Defending national champions, Division Two, fantastic program. Um, you know, it's funny. I had a, we had a Zoom call the other day with all of my college teammates, so we stay in touch pretty regularly. And our team was lots of international guys. We had guys from Liverpool, from Manchester, from Dublin, a couple Trinidadian guys. So we we stay in touch pretty regularly, uh, especially when the EPL is on and we have a lot of banter uh, via Facebook, which is which is pretty fun. But uh, it's kept me in the game. I love it. Uh, and I think that's still, you know, when I talk to people, why, why should you play the game? You know, it's because you still, still stay in touch with your teammates. There's still a big bond. Um, you know, I loved it. And I had a great experience, so I'm pretty fortunate. Yeah, so, so you uh, obviously, uh, you know, you play, played D2. Um, what kind of what led you into the coaching world? You know, I, so when I was in college, I had no idea what I was going to do. I was a history major at one point. I was thinking about going, you know, PE major. Uh, I went to a, into a high school, like, PE class, hated it. Um, so I, was, I had no idea. So I was, then I was going towards exercise science, and that's why I have my degree in. Um, so I thought maybe strength conditioning route. But I still didn't really have a, a final destination in mind. Um, and then in the summers... Uh, my coach started working soccer camps. So I started working his camps at, at Charleston, then traveling around. Uh, he came from Clemson, so he got us working the Clemson camps. Then I started working Duke camps. Um, and that's kind of how I really started thinking about coaching. So when I was at Duke, uh, the head coach asked me if I wanted to be a volunteer when I, when I finished playing. So I jumped at it, absolutely. Worked at Duke, you know, they were, you know, top 15 men's program. Um, so I started working for, for them in, in 95, um, had a great run there, won an ACC championship, had a, just a great experience, loved the guys and the team, um, loved the coaching staff, it was really, really a positive experience for me, and that's kind of what did it, um, you know, and when you're a, a volunteer assistant coach, you know, you, you get paid nothing from the university, you know, I worked at all these different restaurants in Durham, I worked at, um, you know, you're a sport and, you know, you know, all these different places and a manager in position there, phone calls until two in the morning. Um, but I love the job, you know, and I love being there. And I thought I was pretty, um, I was super grateful to be working at Duke, uh, you know, a program of, of such good caliber at that point that I would do it for nothing. Um, so that's, that's kind of where it's, where it all started for me. Yeah, I think um, that's that's one of the things that we've talked about a lot through these through these interviews is the uh, the sacrifices that that uh, that we're willing to make to to continue to be a part of the game and and to to make this a real profession. Yeah, you know, I th I think it's funny when you, a lot of young coaches come up and they get into coaching and and they just want to coach college and then to me, coaching college is not the actual coaching part is not very difficult. Because it's always very, you know who's going to be out at practice every day. You know what you have it as far as facility space. You know, everywhere I've been, I coach club soccer until I got here. And, you know, when you coach club, you might have 10 kids show up, might have 15 kids show up. You might have a full field, might have a half field. If you get bad weather, you got to change. So you've got to be 
adaptable and can change on the fly. You change your complete session based on numbers, based on weather, facility space. So uh, to me, I love coaches that, that have, have had to work the grind of coaching club and developing players, truly developing players. Um, because at college you get players and you can develop them to some degree. But you know, when you're a youth player and you're or youth coach developing players from U12 to U15, there's dramatic, there can be a dramatic increase if you're, if you're a good coach and you know what you're doing and you're really pushing the envelope a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, it's, it's obviously, uh, I, I'm still coaching club and, you know, even with, with all of our technology and team snap and all that stuff, we think we know what we're going to have at training that day, but it's never the same. <laughs> it's always, I think I'm going to have 16 and 12 show up, or I think I'm going to have 12 and 18 show up. So, you know, I've been on both sides of it and it's yeah. uh, definitely, it, it definitely keeps you on your toes. And I think that you're right. I think that that's a, a great tool to, to kind of keep you sharp. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the biggest question I got when I, so when I was at University of Colorado, I was there for 10 years, and my, like my last four years, you know, I'd go on in different interviews for, for head coaching positions, and I would get the same question from ADs, well, you know, you don't have a head coaching experience, per se, on the women's side, you know, what, what can you show that, that you can take over position? And I told them, I said, listen, I've coached way more games than most Division I head women's coaches, because I coached usually one or two teams of fall or spring and I coached multiple games on weekends. So I was coaching, you know, you have a youth team, you have a tournament on a weekend, you're knocking out four games, you know, you do that a bunch of different weekends. You know, I was coaching, head coaching probably 50 games a year minimum, you know, as a youth coach. Um, but, you know, college ADs don't want to, don't understand how much, how impactful that is because you learn to, to you know, cut your teeth a little bit. Um, as a coach, because you fail, you you fail miserably at times. You try something that you might not have done, and all of a sudden it doesn't work. Um, you know, and and you just figure things out more so that way than you would. And I, I was fortunate. My when I got to Duke, my my boss John Rennie was like, "Paul, this is my team. Duke's my 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 team, and um, you'll have input, you'll have a say on this team, but it's still my team." He goes, "You need to coach a boys' team to figure out how to coach." And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. He's like, no, you're coaching a boys team. He's like, this is, this is your new 10 boys team that you're coaching this fall. I'm like, okay, I'm coaching. And he's right. You know, it was, I just finished playing. I didn't really understand coaching. You know, I, I, I love playing. So I think my first year, my first, all I did was jump in with the boys and play small sided all the time. That's, that was my level of coaching expertise at that point. Um, so the kids love that though. <laughs> they loved it. Oh yeah. And then I kept me fit a little bit, you know, which was good. But at the end of the day, I realized that I wasn't good enough as a coach. So I had to get better. Um, so I think that was a turning point for me that realizing that if I want to do this as a career, I've got to invest time, effort, you know, back then there was no internet, not like it today. There was no like beast mode drills and all these things that you can get online and find different things to do. You had to figure stuff out. And, which I think made me a better coach because you come up a session, it, it doesn't go so well, you, then you adapt to it. And you figure things out that work. So to me, it was, it was awesome, you know, and, and I, would not, I would not be near the coach I am today if I didn't coach youth soccer for 15 plus years, you know, throughout my, my journey. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I had a, a very similar experience. I think I'd been the assistant of Mount Olive for two years and I was a very young assistant. I started, I started there when I was only 21, so I was very, very much like the same age as some, some of the players were older than me, actually. Um, so I went to, to school when I was 17 when I, when I got to college. Um, and from my second or third year, you know, our head coach did something very similar. And he, he put me into a club, and he's like, look, I know the club's an hour away, but you got, if you want to do this, you've got to make that sacrifice and you know, we'll get you a little bit of extra money because you're so far away and those kind of things. And, and um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was probably one, it was definitely one of the best things that's been done for me on my coaching journey for sure, because it, it, they put me in with one of the older girls teams and it, it allowed us to, to kind of recruit off of that team a little bit for our team at Mount Olive. And, and it put me in a position where, you know, he actually came out to some of our games just to watch me coach, and he uh, he critiqued me through some of some of my mistakes. And you know, it was nice to to get uh, our our directors at the club kind of gave us gave me some some instruction as well. So it was 
it was great to, to not just get out there and have my own team, but to get some other mentors in the, in the game and that can kind of help, help push things in the right direction. Yeah, you know, I, I, I feel I've been pretty fortunate in my journey as a coach, as a player. I had a really, really good, like, youth program growing up. Like, in high school, like, our, to me, like, high school soccer was a really big deal where I grew up. And you might know Don Martelli. Do you know Don Martelli from Atlanta Fire? Well, okay, well, his dad was my high school coach. Okay. And so now Martelli's are a, a big Italian family in New York, okay? So um, Mr. Martelli, as I call him, he owns a soccer shop in my town in New York. He used to, co- he used to be my Spanish teacher. And I was a small Italian guy who taught Spanish. So he had this Italian guy, the Italian accent teaching Spanish, which was always pretty funny. But he had won so many games, state championship at our, at our high school. He had done so much that he always had the, the older players. So when Don, when I was in high school or younger, Don was playing varsity soccer and they had those guys work with the younger kids. So you felt this connection to the high school team as a, as a little, little kid. He did camps and, and back then, I didn't realize who these people were, but you had all these coaches come up and do sessions for us, and do his, his camp in the summer. So you had these guys who played at the highest levels, coached at the highest levels in the, in the US at that time, who had you know, played everywhere. And so to me, that was fantastic. And uh, he really kind of got that itch in the game, really. Um, and then as you get older, you start playing for different teams. You have different ODP coaches who were really, really good in New York back then. Like where I grew up in New York, New Jersey was a really big hotbed of soccer, especially back then. So ethnic. Um, and you had different pockets of, you know, you played against the Brooklyn Italians. You played against Hota. You played against all these different teams that had different ethnic backgrounds to them. And, and it was awesome. The games were really serious, so like, and they meant something. Um, and then high school soccer was big, so I think you get that component, and then you get so you're kind of in a in a, a good soccer environment. Then you go to college, and then you get working for these different coaches, and and Randy gets me coaching club, and and then you start getting around. It. And I think the biggest thing with coaching club is you learn how to deal with the players. Probably more importantly, you learn to deal with parents. Mm-hmm. You know, so you you, you have to be. You gotta figure out how to be strong enough as a person when you're 24 years old that you're talking to an adult who's well older than you, who has kids, about how you're gonna run things and how you're gonna do things. So, and now it's funny because now it's full circle. I have kids who are involved in club soccer, and now I'm the parent who's listening to the coach who's younger, and and you know, and so it's it's a unique experience, but one that I wouldn't change for anything. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the uh, the other side of that now as well with my son kind of getting that age where he's starting to play a little bit more serious and stuff like that. And and I've I've run into a couple times that the coaches will come to me and be like, "What do you think, Mike? Whatever you whatever you whatever you think, you know, I'm going to be the best parent you have because I'm going to stand in the corner and I'm not going to talk to anybody and I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to say a word on the sidelines." So, yeah, I just I, I would, in my ideal world, if I could sit and watch my son play and just put some music in my headphones and just not worried about the soccer part of things. Um, it was great because he had two boys. My wife coaches my youngest, his, you know, his team. And so I get to watch them and then I can watch, watch my oldest play. So it's, those things are, are the enjoyable moments, you know, and, and to be honest with our career and way we do things, you know, you don't get to see a lot of games, especially in the fall. So when you chance to get out and watch something is, is fun to do. Um, it's fun to expose them to different parts of the game. Um, you know, they come to all of our games, all of our, our men's games. So, they're around the game quite a bit, way more so than, than I ever was when I was a kid, which is, which is pretty unique. Yeah, I think the, the game is so much more accessible now. Um, it's so much easier, easier to find games. You know, I was, I was pretty lucky. You know, I grew up in Wilmington, so I was always at UNCW games. Um, and and it, was, it was great to watch them. And then we were, were lucky enough to get uh, Wilmington Hammerheads who were in the old USISL. So that was, that was kind of like we – I felt like I had my own little soccer heaven where I got to go watch yeah. all the time. And, and high school was pretty big for us at the time as well because, you know, with, it was just a different environment without the, the DA and ECNL and telling kids they can't play for their high school teams. And, you know, like going to, to watch state playoffs at that point was you're going to go watch a high-level game. Yeah. So I think everything, everything has changed quite a bit, you know, with, you know, with the advent of the ECNL, the advent of, you know, the DA and now the, the – the ending of the DA. Um, but, you know, to me, like, I, I always thought the, the, the most vivid memories I have of, as a youth coach were of trying to win a state cup, 
you know, then trying to go to regionals. You know, I, I think that reminded me most of high school because you're playing in, the, in knockout games all the time. Whereas now you watch some of these kids play and, and there's not a whole lot of knockout games. They don't compete in many knockout games. Every tournament's a friendly or a, a showcase. And there's never much on the line for these kids. And I think, I think that's what's missing quite a, quite a bit in a lot of players. And to be honest, a lot of coaching. How many coaches are competing in knockout games where there's pressure, there's real pressure to advance? And um, you always knew where you stood when you have State Cup. You know, if, if you won, you kept on playing. If you lost, well, why'd you lose? And this, is this, what's the reason for the loss? Is it the players, the coach? So there's always, I felt, um, that, that bit of accountability at some level as a coach and as a player. So I love that. I love those old days. Um, I would love to get back to something like that more so than, than it is now. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously we, we talk about trying to develop kids more now. And um, I think that you, you've still got to develop that competitive fire as well. And, um, you know, I interviewed one of my friends who is, he's in coaching education. He coaches high school here in North Carolina. And that was one of the things that he said was that he feels like players now are probably much more technical than they were. Um, but they don't have that bite and that competitive competitive fire in them. Oh, listen, I, so growing up in New York, I always felt like there was always real technical kids. There was always some Hispanic kids or Italian, little ethnic kids who were real technical. But then there was always, always the New York bite. I, like, even now when you watch kids play, even my wife said when, she, when her team from North Carolina would go play Region 1 teams, she's like, there's always something different about Region 1 teams, especially New York, New Jersey teams, you know, Philadelphia, like that type of area. Like, they had more bite. and I think you're right. There's so many kids. The, the game is so much higher level now, like technically. Well, well, well more advanced than it was when we were playing. Um, but there was, a, there was not bite. There's not I mean, crunching tackles. There's, there's none of that really, that I, especially on the women's side that I see. As, but there's more flair. There's more possession. Um, you know, so some of that stuff is, is all well and good uh, to develop players, develop their thinking, their IQ. But there's also, you know, the, a whole player is like, you know, when, when you're looking at players who try to make it professionally, it's competitive. You know, like it is super competitive. And if they don't have that, that in, in innate ability to compete on the highest level, they're not going to make it. So that, that's the part, that's the part to me that I think we need to keep on focusing on as coaches, as, as, you know, guardians of the game, if you will, that, that they've got to keep on com competing on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, You've been at Coastal Carolina for quite a while now. How have you seen the program kind of evolve during your time there? So I've been here at nine years. So I've, I've, I've had nine seasons here, I think, and maybe next year it's my 10th. And it's, it's changed a lot. You know, we've had a variety of different changes. So when I first got here, I was a third coach in three years. Okay, so you take an over program that's had some, you know, just – change there's no continuity in the program so that's the biggest thing you have to kind of you know change that and, and start from 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 what I was used to and I, you know I, when I left Colorado we were a top 20 team been in the tournament you know eight years in a row you know so you're trying to get that mentality into the kids you know so that that changed but I since I've been here we've had great kids like really good kids my first couple of years we had great kids in the program um and, but we've had to change and, and, and turn around to, to, to the way I want to play and the way we want to do certain things. Um, but, the, but even, you know, the last four years, last three years now, we've been in a new conference. So things have changed, one, in, in, in trying to establish a program. And once we got to where we were, we felt like we were kind of humming along in, our, in, the, in the Big South, all of a sudden, bang, we go to the Sun Belt. And now I think we've had four years in the Sun Belt, you know, so that's been a big change you know, as far as everything that goes with being a conference has a massive geographic footprint, you know, we play Texas State, you know, that is a pretty long flight. So those things have changed. So it really had to change what we do and how we do things, you know, midway through our, my time here, which is always good. You always want challenges as coaches. And so you, that presents a different recruiting model or presents a different travel model. You know, everything you do is different. So I think that's been a big change. Just the university in whole has changed. You know, there's been a lot of change in our campus, a lot of change in, in, in who we are as a university. So, you know, I think every, every school goes through their, through their growth processes, through growing pains, if you will. Um, 
pandemics, you know, who knows, whatever, you know, you, you go through. And so you kind of get to roll the punches as best you can and see where it takes you. Yeah, and no, I can uh, definitely attest to, to the quality of your kids that you, you brought in for sure because, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to come in and work your camps over the last probably three or four years, if not longer. And um, mm -hmm. you know, your, your players have always been extremely uh, helpful, willing to jump in, do whatever needs to be done, whatever to ask of them. So, you know, I can definitely attest that you guys are definitely bringing in great kids. Yeah, and that's, and that's, the, that's the start of everything, you know. Like, if you have good kids in your program – you know, we're, as you know, we're around these kids all the time, you know, and, and we've had a couple of situations where we've had, you know, to leave for hurricanes, you know, and when you're around kids for 21, 23 straight days in the road, you get to know who they are, you know, for, for good or, or, you know, it's like, it's like marriage, you know, like, you know, for better or worse, you know, so I, I think for me, having good kids in the program, people you can trust, um, is a cornerstone of a program, you know, if, you know, so we spend a lot of time in the recruiting process, and that's changed over time too. Like our recruiting process has changed, but I think now it's, it's trying to find the right kids, not always the best kids, find the right kids that are going to fit in and, and do what we ask. You know, um, kids who have high academic goals, you know, who are team oriented, kids who love the game, you know. So we've really started work changing our recruiting process and even our coaching. You know, I, I spent some time up with Marty Beal last year about doing some different stuff culture wise. Um, we picked each other's brains a bit, you know, we, we talked through some things and that was helpful for me to kind of sit down and, and navigate to who we're going to be in the future. And, and so to me, that's important. Um, but getting the right kid is the most important piece. You know, we had a coach at uh, Colorado football coach, coach Barnett, who said, it's not the kids you don't get that hurt you. It's the kids that you do get that hurt you. So if you get the wrong kid and they come to you, they can eat your program up. You know, so it's better to, to miss on a kid who's super talented but not a great kid than to get that kid who's a headache. And, and you know, you hear about it all the time, having seen these really good players ruin programs. And, you know, so we kind of stayed away from that. We try to – we try we ask kids – one of the biggest questions we ask kids now is, what is your why? Like, why are you playing the game? And, you know, it's funny when you have parents in the room, sometimes the parents start answering the question for the kids, and you're like, that's a red flag already. Yeah. You know, I was – Listen, when kids get to college and they're on their own to make decisions, there's a lot of kids who quit. Just quit because they've done it their whole life because their mom and dad have asked them to do it, and that's what they've always done. And, and they supposedly loved it, but I think they've always liked it, never really loved it. And when they get to college, it's harder. It's just more – there's more challenging. There's more time demands. And um, I think when they get to their own devices and they're like, I'm not the best player here anymore. I'm really, really struggling to, to find playing time. And – I don't love it. You know, what's the point of doing it? So you see a lot of kids just kind of drop out of the game based on that. So we've got to do our due diligence and, and find out why they play the game, how much they really love it. Do they love the grind? Do they love the training? Do they love the workouts by themselves in the summer? Because if, if they do, then you can coach them. I can take any kid who does that stuff. But the other kids, we've got to constantly motivate and constantly push, and they're the hard kids to, to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, no, I think I had a, a similar situation to kind of what you're talking about. Probably probably two weeks ago, I lost a recruit to a, a conference school, and I was kind of down for a little bit. And then I pulled up Twitter and saw some things that were on our Twitter and Instagram pages and went, oh, wow, I really dodged the bullet there. You know, they can have it. So, you know, I think that, that, that due diligence is a, is a big piece for sure. You know, I probably should have done that due diligence a little bit earlier, uh, personally. Uh, well, you know, I mean, Reed, it's funny, like, Part of, part of our, you know, everybody does camps, everybody does their own, you know, they do camps for a variety of reasons. We use camp as a recruiting tool, obviously. We want kids to, can we, can we get a kid out of camp? And that's the goal of every camp we have. Can we find at least one player that we can matriculate to our roster? Can we find that kid? But also at camp, you know, we leave the room, we let kids ask questions to our current players, and, and we're not there. So we don't know what they ask. But if there's any red flags that go up, our kids will tell us, hey, this kid was asking questions about partying, about what do we do on weekends. Everything stemmed about the wrong, the wrong question, you know. So they'll let us know. They'll let us know who doesn't fit the, the mold of what we're looking for. And that's helpful, you know, because then I can go back to the player and say, listen, you know, like, it's not going to be a good fit. It's not going to work out. No hard feelings, but, you know, we're, we're not the best fit for you as a, as, a, as a player and student athlete. So that's the hard part is finding those – 
you know, again, everybody will say the right questions or right answers in front of their parents. Mm -hmm. But when they're on their own, are they gonna are they gonna ask questions? What questions are they asking? And then are they gonna answer questions honestly? You know, and the kids that do and they they ask the right questions, then we want those kids in our program. But the kids that, you know, like you said, are on Instagram having a party lifestyle and then they're asking our kids about party and not you don't want those kids in your program because they're not gonna make it. Those will make it worse for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, especially where both of our locations are, that's that's always the uh, the thing we've got to be sure of with, with you guys being so close to Myrtle Beach and with us being in downtown Raleigh. It's, uh, it can be very easy to go down the wrong path. Easily, yes. Um, so what would you guys, what would you, what would you uh, say is, is y'all's playing style there at Coastal? Um, you know, that's good. It's a good question. It's changed a lot over time, I think, based on, on, on who we have and what we have coming in and all those things. So we're, I'm not locked into any kind of certain style. You know, the game has changed a lot, too, in the last bunch of years. Now everybody's playing out of the back. They're doing all this building stuff, and, which is I believe in. Um, you know, I believe in, I believe in possession of the ball, but I believe in possession with purpose. I, I hate when teams go side to side and just go nowhere. Um, and then you hear the coaches talk on Twitter after the game. We, have, we, we dominated possession. We just couldn't score. Well, yeah, you dominated possession. We let you have the ball, you know, in your end for, for bits of time. So there's – I think that stat is such a, a, a jaded stat. You can make possession as much as you want. If I have two forwards and you have four backs and a goalkeeper, yeah, you're going to keep possession longer than we are up there. But we're not trying to press with two players and, and against your five. Um, you know, but I think – you know, as we look to, to get better, I think we, we try to press. I think we try to be an aggressive team. Defense, we try to play a high line. Um, I think we can play. I think we look for kids who are pretty adaptable, pretty flexible in their positions. They can interchange amongst other players. Um, I love a technical player. I love kids who can have – I don't want a whole team full of little cute little players on the ball, but I, there's got to be a balance of, of kids who, are, who can move. I want – wide players being athletic. I want wide players, both outside backs, outside forwards, who can win 1v1 duels, you know, both offensively, defensively. Um, ideally, you want, you want a kid who who's can score some goals up front, who's good in the ball. Um, but, I, you know, I think next year we'll, we'll be a team that tries to press a bit more, to be a little more aggressive that way, you know, start playing higher up the field defensively, um, and then get our outside. I think we are, we'll be pretty athletic next year. Just try to use that to to our to the best of our ability. Um, you know, we'll see how this whole summer goes with where kids are fitness wise and all that stuff. But I think that's a big thing we were looking at in the spring. Let's let's be real fit. Let's get to a point where we can press effectively. And I don't know if you watched the, the, the you know the she believes cup, but I, I thought our women's team pressed really well against England. Not so well against Spain, but I thought there were some really good moments. Um, that we use as, as some kind of coaching tools. Uh, so clips we send our, our players about, hey, this looked really good, how they pressed collectively as a group, more so than I've seen them do before. Um, so that's, that's what I think we will, will be next year. Um, but again, you know, during the course of the season, based on injuries, based on how much you traveled for a game, all these things, it, it, I think the kids that we want are, are the most flexible. They can handle high pressing, they can sit, they can sit in, they can do, I just want kids who have the ability, IQ wise, physically, to play a variety of, of situations, a variety of styles, even in the course of the game. You know, I love to be able to press the team in the first half and then change, exactly, change everything in the second half and play something a little different just to totally mess with the other team. Because the other team, half time, introducing their first half. So, might be hard to do all the time, but I think that'd be the, the ideal team for me. Yeah, I think that one of the things that, that we're trying to, to really work with with our girls and peace about is, you know, we, we, we try to press quite a bit, but we want to try to recognize when to press and when not to and, and some of those visual cues and, and, the, and place parts of the field where, where we want to send numbers and where we want to kind of stay organized and kind of just force things in different areas. Yeah, and it all depends on, you know, team's fitness level and, and hey, do you play Friday, Sunday, and is your, you know, Sunday game at 1 o'clock in the, in the heat of the South? Is that, is that a great game to press on? Probably not if you play Friday night, you know. So there's certain things that will make it more advantageous to pressing. Um, you know, some days will be better than others, you know. And the thing is, if you're trying to press and you're not pressing well, 
you're going to get lit up. So yeah. I think that's the hard part. And I watch, you know, Premier League games, all this other stuff. It's the, the weather's way more conducive there to pressing than it is to, you know, a Sunday afternoon anywhere in the South. Um, Cause it's so humid and so hot that, you know, you can press for a bit of time, but if once you start losing numbers based on just fatigue, um, it becomes a lot more challenging to collectively press as a group. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so you guys have, have got some, some international kids on your roster. Um, are you actually able to go over or are you doing more of your recruiting by video? Uh, it'll be both. You know, we, we've gone over, we've, we've seen some kids live, we've seen some kids via video. Um, you know, the, the thing with me, again, is with, with the international kids, is just trying to get to know who they are as people. Um, and we've had some really good success with the international kids. We've had some really good kids. We've had, I'll say one of the, the most technical players that I've ever had here at Coastal, Danny Family, has been, was a Swedish kid who was fantastic. She was so good in the ball, technically. Um, now, it took her a bit of time to get used to the, the heat one. The style of play here was so physical. Um, but she was so good in the ball. Like, she was fantastic. So we could build a team around a kid like her. Uh, but she also had a pretty easy personality. She was super easy, easy going. Um, she never got down too low, never got too high. Um, pretty a steady kid. So uh, I like kids like her. And the thing you deal with some international kids, they're, I find them, they're vastly more mature. They just, they're, they're just more mature. You know, a lot of times they're doing stuff by themselves over there. They're not dependent on their parents. You know, anytime I've asked a kid from Europe or anywhere really to, to give us something, send us something, they do it pretty quickly. Um, they, they just, you know, I'd say an 18 year old American is like a, or 20 year old or 18 year old European is like a 22 year old American at times. Um, so those things matter. I think those things having maturity in your team matter. You know, the things in Europe that, that we don't know with all over the world is that they are used to playing with limited substitutions. So you've got to really teach them about the substitution policy here because it is so different for them. Um, but I think they, they bring maturity. They bring a different – they love the game differently than we do. Um, they're exposed to it a lot more from a younger age. A lot of times their parents are diehards into the game. Their dads or moms are, have watched, you know, football for a long time, and they love it. So there's some history there with the families. Um, it's, it's, it's a cool opportunity to expose your kids to somebody different. And then expose your kids. You know, our team is – our roster really – in all of the United States national. So we've got kids from Arizona, New York, New Jersey, Georgia, you know, every, really everywhere. And then you spring kids from international backgrounds. We've got a girl from, from Iceland, a Swedish kid, an Asian kid, an English kid. You know, they're all sprinkled in the roster. So it's good to have them spread out a little bit amongst classes. And I think they provide a little bit of, um, like I said, maturity and just a different, which is always good to have your, to different types of people um you know i know that we've had some other kids from iceland in the past and, and another girl from sweden in the past and um our kids will travel around you know after college and maybe go see these kids or so it's kind of a, it's a cool way to kind of expose them to the different parts of the world as well yeah i think you know my, my college team uh, whenever i first got to college we had kids from africa we had, had a kid from jamaica we had a kid from canada who was originally from turkey so I, it's, and, and I, I was always drawn to those players because they have very different life experiences than all the other Eastern North Carolina kids that I played with. Um, and and I, they, were, they were some of our better players as well, so that all needs to help. Um, sure. You know, the Jamaican, the Jamaican kid led the nation in assists my junior year, which was fantastic for me because I was on the opposite end of a lot of those passes. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it's a completely different uh, perspective. And, you know, I think it, it brings a, a, lot, a lot of maturity to the team, for sure. What's, uh, what's one of your favorite coaching memories? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a hard – I thought about that question a little bit. That's a hard one because I, I think you're invested in so much in each one of your teams, right? So that it seems like almost every year there's a certain memory that stands out. Um, there are certain things that are, you know, like a winning – you know, at, at Colorado we had – one in, in back to back weekends, we beat UCLA at home in extra time, and we beat we beat on the road. We beat A and M, you know. So those are massive wins that 
in massive places against great teams. So those, those things stand out. Winning a Big 12 championship was, was massive. Winning an ACC championship was massive. Um, but there's little moments, like, like there's memories that I think of like that have nothing to do with wins or losses. A graduation, a hurricane, you know, <laughs> leaving for a hurricane. So there's, it, I, I don't necessarily love that some things are tied based on results. This memory is great because we've won. And, but some of the losses are, are memorable or some of the, the bus trips. So to me, it, it's hard to, to give one, hey, this is it. This is it. Um, we had some really awesome, at Colorado, we had some really awesome like semifinal wins in the, in the tournament. Since I've been here now in the Sun Belt, we've had some great, we lost in, our first two years in the Sun Belt, we lost in a conference championship game. And our second year, I remember to this day, like we, we, we beat Georgia Southern in the semifinals. And the van ride back to our, our condos, we were jamming away to music. We were, I was, it was journey was on and I'm singing, the girls are singing. We were like rocking and rolling on this van. That will stick with me forever. Like I truly was one of the best memories because we were, we were just having a blast. Um, and we were a seven seed, you know, so we, we beat the number two seed in the first round game. We beat Georgia Southern in the semifinal. Then losing to South Al in the final, but just getting there, that whole trip was awesome. Like, so you have those memories, those moments that you can look at a player 20 years from now and say, remember Journey in, that, in, the, in the bus ride? And nowadays kids are videotaping in the car, so you have clips of it. And so those things to me are, are, are like, they'll live with me forever, you know, and that's kind of why you coach, that's why you do what you do because of those moments, those moments of pure joy, you know, and like I try to talk to people about, so my father-in-law is in the business world. My, my father is a, is a, was, an old, was a retired cop. Like in, in some parts of, if you're a businessman, like what's the high of your high? Like, like they don't, I think in our job, our highs are better than most highs, right? But our lows are just the worst. Yeah. And I don't know if people go through those, those same emotions as we do on a pretty weekly basis, especially in the season. Um, you know, and, and I remember, I still remember stories from my, my old boss at Colorado. He was a head coach at Duke for, for, he started the women's program at Duke, you know, and so he had beaten North Carolina to end their hundred and some odd game win streak, you know, and now there's a natural rival anyway, Duke Carolina is a huge rivalry anyway. And then to beat North Carolina who had won 112 straight games at that point, um, he, he beats them. He's back at his office like 20 minutes later, like, geeked out of his mind, super excited. Everybody's calling him in the world. He's a player stopped by the office and said, hey, how come I didn't play tonight? Like he's like, so from, from the high of the high to the low of the low and within 20 minutes, he's like, so, but that's coaching. You know, that's what it does, you know, like, you know, and, and so I think that's the hard part. But the, the good part and the, and the hard part is, you know, and I'm sure your, your family can attest to the same thing that when I come home and we lose, I'm a bear for a day or two. I'm just a grumpy person. And my wife's got to deal with that. She, she, she knows when I'm grumpy and she knows like how to deal with me. And then, you know, hopefully I'm hoping the next day I wake up and I can, you know, move on to the next day and, and stuff. But sometimes those losses sting and they sit with you for, even if, you, you know, playing poorly and winning, you're like, just eats away at you. So, you know, you know, I know a lot of people have a job where they, they pipe, you know, they check in, they check out and then they're done for the weekend. There's no, you know, for us, you know, we work every weekend, you know, there's during the fall. I, I, I don't know if there's a day off. I truly don't from mid July until it's over in November. Hopefully there's not a day off really. And then you have right once that season ends, then you're in recruiting season. So that usually goes until December 15th now. So it, it's really in, from mid July to mid December. You're not, there's not like, you can't take a vacation like week in that time period. You know, that's, that's the part to me that being a, a person with a real job, like they have six weeks vacation a summer or a year. Anytime they want, they can take that. You know, we can't do that. <laughs> you know, like it's just a different career path. And I, there's some things I love about it. There's some things that after a while, I'm like, man, it just gets old, but it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my family can uh, definitely tell when we, when we played well and when we have it. You know, when we have it, I walk in the door, my son says, you guys lost, didn't you? Yeah. I said, 
all right, I'm gonna go in the other room. <laughs> yeah. I come and, and sit in this room where my projector is, and usually I throw the game film up, turn the lights off, and then everybody just leaves me alone. The same here, yeah. We do the same, absolutely. So, um, you know, what do you feel like is uh, is one of the most important pieces of being a coach for you? I would say, um, you know, as you get older, as a coach, you know, I, I think the some of the biggest thing is, is connecting with your players at some level. Um, you know, I, I think that's always harder and harder as you one if you're a guy and you're getting older, is trying to stay connected in some way. Um, you know, I think the the X and O's are, are easy, but that's not connecting with players. You know, like trying to form a true connection with a player is sometimes hard because now with kids getting, well, them being the same age, but us getting older every year, you know, and technology changing so much that they're so tuned into technology that they're more likely to give one word answers. So sometimes it's hard to really dig in and find out who they are. Um, but that's part of it. So finding connection to, to, to players um, and then building, you know, building a culture. I think that's the, the fun part is trying to build something that provides purpose for these kids. You know, as if there's a purpose for what you're doing, then they'll like doing it. Um, but you've got to provide what, what that is. Um, cause they play so many games in our life. Like I think some of that gets lost. Um, so it's those two things that to me are, are massively important. Um, if you can't connect with your kids and, you know, I always watch, I look at certain people and certain coaches during my lifetime, and I'm a huge Duke basketball fan. You know, I watch Coach K coach, and, and senior day, those kids come off the field hugging him and run, run up to him and give him hugs, and um, that's the kind of coach you want to be. Now it's, it's much harder on the, uh, to be a, a male coach on the female side and have that kind of experience because um, you're always guarded a little bit. But, you know, I tell my players I love them all the time. You know, I, I do because I, you know, I, they're, they're good kids and, um, you know, our kids are going to make mistakes. They're, they're college kids, but it's just them holding them accountable to what they're doing. And, 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 you know, my dad always told me, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner, you know? So like, you can't, you got to understand that I made plenty of mistakes when I was in college. <laughs> and so I'm not the moral police, but you got to hold them in line to what you're trying to do as a program because we all have bosses. We all got people we got to answer to. And when they get in trouble, you know, stuff kind of falls downhill and it will fall on me eventually and then them. So ideally you build a culture that's something that that's not important. The things that they're doing off the field aren't as important as the things you're doing on the field. Um, but you've got to show them what that is and how great that experience is. Because to this day, like I said earlier, my college experience was awesome. I loved it. And you want to make sure that they understand that too, that it could be awesome. And some of the awesomeness, of experience is in the worst moments when you're doing sprints as a player and you're, and you hate it in preseason camp when it's so miserable, those are moments that you look back on as a player and realize that was awesome, but it's hard to do it in the moment because it's, it's not so much fun at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, with, as far as the, the technology goes, you know, you brought that up. What, uh, what are you guys doing with your, with your team currently? So right, right now we do, we do, I mean, as far as technology, like, like social media type stuff or other, or like, um, obviously, you know, I think pretty much every program that I've seen doing zoom meetings and doing some, some kind of, some kind of digital coaching right now. Um, what, what are you guys? Yeah. Doing? Yeah. So we, we do some stuff. Like, so I, I've got it. We've changed our philosophy, not changed it, but my philosophy right now is that these kids are pretty overwhelmed with, with work as far as I think, I think teachers are giving them more work because they're so worried about them not getting enough work that they're just giving them busy work. So I don't want to compound that with over meeting too much. So we do Zoom meetings. We'll meet with classes. You know, right now in the process of next week of having individual meetings, end of the year meetings with my players via Zoom or FaceTime. Um, but we've been doing, so, you know, Marco Polo, the app. So we have that and we have, so whatever number the players are on that day of the month, they've got to leave inspirational message, whether it be a quote, something that, so all the kids stay connected. To me, that's the biggest thing right now is we just want to stay connected. Um, so we have, we, we break our team into families in the spring and fall, actually. So in the spring, they've got to do like a family dinner once a week and they got to do it virtually. So it's more challenging, but it's a way to do it. Um, so we've been doing a lot of those type of things. Uh, we're, sh we're sharing some different film that we cut for them. Um, 
just different ways, but I don't want to overdo it. I really don't, you know, they're getting stuff from our strength coach about working out and, and stuff, but you know, I can't look at what they're doing. I have no idea. It's, it's hope we're, we trust in that they're doing the right thing. I think a lot of kids are bored out of their minds. So they're going out and doing some extra work. We're running anyway, fitness wise. Um, but where we've been, like I said, once school starts winding down, which will, it'll start winding down in the next couple of weeks, we'll start kind of ramping up what we're doing um, with them at that point. Because uh, I think at that point, they'll have finals done. They'll be, you know, some kids have final projects right now. They're doing a lot of stuff online. I don't want them attached to their computer all day, every day either. I want them getting outside the house and, and being engaged in other things. Even if they're going for, you know, for me, I, we challenge our kids, listen, build your relationship with your family at this point. You know, you, you're home, go on walks with your mom, go, you know, do whatever. If they're not, if they're not, if they can work remotely, then take them out of the house, do some exercise with them. Um, so I think it's a challenge, but it's, to me, again, the biggest thing is maintaining a connection between Coastal and them and the soccer program and, and that they understand that this is going to end at some point and they've got to get back because what could happen? It can end and, and a week later they're here, you know, and if they've not done anything over the summer, then they'll pay the consequences, you know, and I told them that nobody's going to feel sorry for them. Like nobody is. Um, your opponents aren't going to feel sorry for you because they're all in the same boat. And um, so they've got to make sure that they're, they're maintaining a, a, as much as they can what, what they've been doing and then hopefully ramping that up over the summer. So then when we get back, we can really get going for the, for the fall season. Yeah, yeah, I think we're we're in kind of a similar boat. You know, we, we meet once a week as a team, and then, you know, I see tons of Instagram posts of the girls chatting away and, and doing all that stuff. So I think that we're, we're very much trying not to overwhelm our kids as well. They start exams next week, so we'll have our, our last call uh, this afternoon, um, and then they'll be off for a little while, and then we kind of get back at it through the summer a little bit more. Yeah. But I think it's, 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 in a way, obviously it sucks not being with the team, but it's been good for us because now we know that we can effectively communicate as a group when we're away from each other. Yeah, you know, like I'm always trying to find positives in all these things. And I think to me the biggest thing is that, um, you know, well, I've never spent this much time at my house in my life. Like I've never spent this much time with my own family. So that's been a cool thing. Um, it's been hard to for certain moments but then, but I'm like, wow, like, I would love to get back in my office and do some work <laughs> right now. Um, but, it, it, you know, you're around your kids. You're doing home projects. You're doing things at the house. You know, I'm working at weary hours, so I can be doing work, like, at night when I have some more downtime. Um, but I think with us and with our program, like, kids are, like, and we've dealt with this based on some of our hurricane evacuations, right? But you can realize that kids can still connect via social media. They can still do all those things. We can still – I've had to adapt as a coach. You know, I've read more books. I'm doing, you're doing more things that way, trying to read different things, trying to look at webinars, whatever they may be, send to your players, say, you know, hey, look at, look at this. You know, so there's ways to, to, you know, I told our team the other day, you can either survive or, or thrive in this thing. And I said, you got to look to thrive, you know, and I said, it, it might sound weird thriving during a pandemic, but there's, there's the other way. You can just sit on your couch and eat because I know people are cooking more eating more at their house than they probably ever have. Same, <laughs> baking. I'm baking, we're making pizza, homemade pizza, we're doing all that stuff, right? Um, but the thing is with kids, like what are they doing? And, and like I said, they've, they've gotta be willing to, to go out and do stuff when, when is, so I've been running, I'm, I'm training for a half marathon and I've run more in April than I've driven my car by a lot. You know, so I told my kids, like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more fit during this, <laughs> this thing. I mean, I mean, I typically would have any way of training for a marathon, a half marathon, but listen, you've got to find ways to get out and, and keep yourself occupied mentally, physically, if you want to be successful next fall. Yeah, and I think, you know, me as a coach, that's part of, part of why I started this interview series. Obviously, you know, you know it's I, a bit selfishly, it's, it's a chance for me to pick coaches' brain, but it's also a chance for me to try to help other coaches kind of get some information out there. And, you know, I think um, – it's it's been pretty well received so far, but we're obviously very very early in it, and you know it's I like where it's headed though. No, it's awesome. I always, I mean, sometimes you know when you get questions you haven't thought about in a while, it makes you think about what they are, you know, and that's a good thing to to, to kind of because usually right now you've kid visiting campus and they they ask a lot of these questions. You know, what's your style of play? What's this? And 
well, you haven't keep anybody visit anybody visit campus in a month, so you kind of you sometimes forget, you know, what is my favorite session or what what was what what do I like most or what's what's my style of coaching? What kind of coach am I? So it's good to answer those questions and, and kind of feel like you're you're actually doing something again. Yeah, this is uh this is getting me very busy for sure, for sure. So <laughs> Well, we uh, we really appreciate you taking some time for us today. You know, uh, um, you know, I feel like you know I'm kind of invested in your program a little bit myself uh, personally, just because I've I've been around uh, a little bit, and you know, I really I really enjoy getting to, to come on campus and and work camps and and be around the program and get to know your girls and, and get to know your boys and, and Allie and, and all that good stuff. No, I same. You know, I think uh, as you, the more you coach, you're invested in people, and I'm invested in you for sure. I always want you to be super, super successful. I always root for you when you're Mount Olive now. More pizza. I mean, I want you to be successful there. You know, it's just good people. Like to me, when good people do well, that's, that's the biggest thing. You know, and you gotta celebrate those victories. And you know, I think you had probably the most wins in your program's history this year. You know, you had you did a lot of things this year as a program, which was which is cool to, cool to see from, from my perspective and from everybody else's coaching. You know, you want your friends to do well and to be successful. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm excited about for you and your future there. I know you'll do great things and hope you keep on coming back, working our camps for sure. Yeah, hopefully we can get back to camp soon. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, but thanks, thanks again for coming on. We'll talk soon, Paul. Awesome. Thanks, Reed. Appreciate it.